Welcome back to another edition of History in Your Own Backyard. I'm your host, Susie Salk, and today we're in Bell Fountain, Ohio, here at the Logan County Engineer's Office, and I happen to be joined by the engineer himself, Scott Coleman. Good to have you. Good to have you here. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. Our pleasure. And joined with me also is the president of the Ohio Historic Bridge Association, David Simmons. Thank you for being here. Always a pleasure. All right. So we are going to be talking about the Logansville Iron Bridge on, is it is it County Road 21? Correct. So David, what is so special about our, our Iron Bridge here? This is an iron bridge built in 1882 uh, to replace a wooden bridge that was only a few years old. And it is really significant for its trust design and for its history. For all the uh, excitement uh, that's given for historic covered bridges, it's really this kind of bridge, a pin-connected bridge, that American engineers were known for in the 19th century. What do you, what do you mean when you say pin-connected? Well, the bridge is literally held together by pins. These are iron pins with threads on the end and then nuts that, that hold them in place. And that's in contrast to the rivets that were used in Europe. Now, there are, in fact, rivets all through this bridge, but they're rivets that were placed by in the shop by very heavy uh, equipment that couldn't be brought out into the field. Okay. And they, um, so the bridge would be fabricated in the shop in various components, and then those pieces would, would be brought out to the site. A wooden platform would be built, and the structure would be erected, and it would be held together by these pins, kind of like a, a, a uh, you know the the classic erector set. Yeah, you know, it's it's really the, the the same concept. Okay. And um, the so the rivets were only done in the shop, and the only the the connections in the field were done by these pins, because um, two reasons: it was a a simple and efficient system. And labor was always more expensive in America. Right. So American engineers wanted to take advantage of that fact and keep labor costs as low as possible. Mm -hmm. It accomplished that. Plus, they were also suspicious of rivets that were not done in the shop, that were done in the field. It wasn't until 1899 that a air-compressed system of a tool was developed to make good solid field rivets so 1900 is like the cutoff date anything before that were these pin connected and anything after they started using field rivets Gosh. to connect the bridges you mentioned a specific type of truss earlier what exactly is a truss well we can demonstrate that if we use a framework with nuts in each corner screws and bolts uh, you can see it's very flexible but if i take and add a simple diagonal member here, it becomes rigid and no longer is that flexible. And essentially what I've done is created a truss. Are you seeing this, Scott? Yes, I'm seeing this. Oh, okay, this it, it really works. This is good stuff, David. <laughs> so that explains the configuration of a truss, thank you. But now how does it work? Well, any truss has two types of forces that, that act on it, uh, forces that that are pushed together, said to be compression, and forces that pull apart are said to be in tension. And if you think of uh, arrows pushing together, pointing to each, each other as the compression, and then uh, arrows going apart from each other as the tension member, in a drawing you can actually understand what components work in a truss and, and the arrangement of the tension members and the compression members is what defines a particular type of truss. So in an iron truss, it's really easy to see what parts are the compression members and what parts are the tension members because they look visually very different. The compression member is going to be very heavy and built up, and the tension members are going to be much much slender and much much thinner. Um, and in a in a through truss, which this is, in other words, traffic drives through the bridge. The inclined end post and the top cord are always going to be in compression and the bottom member is always going to be in tension. The tension members will always have eyes on each end to accommodate the pins that I mentioned before. Yep. 
so that, that that is how it's all connected with those pins. So the, each of the, the uh, tension members has to have those eyes at each end. And American engineers were really re- renowned for the precision because if you're creating a structure like this, it has to be created with very, very close tolerances. So American engineers were really known for their ability to create these members in very precise measurements, something that the Europeans were just astounded that, that, that this could be done in American factories. For the Logansville Iron Bridge specifically, how did the truss work? Well, this is a form of a Pratt truss, and in a Pratt truss, the verticals are always going to be in compression, and the diagonals are going to be in tension. The thing that's distinctive about this is that it's not a single intersection Pratt, but a double intersection Pratt. So the diagonals cross from uh, cross the first diagonal that comes or the first vertical it comes to and goes to the second vertical. So that's where the name double intersection comes from. Gotcha. It was a type of truss that was developed in the 1840s by the railroads for long span structures. Um, and when the first railroad bridge was built across the Ohio River in 1865, this was the kind of truss that was used. Huh. And it became the standard in the Ohio Valley for 25 years. But it is a system that became very popular on highways in Ohio. And there are really only about a dozen of these bridges still standing in the state. And there are very few of them that are still open to traffic like this one is. Um, And the structure itself is very carefully proportioned. By that, I mean that the size of the diagonals varies from one end to the middle and then from the middle to the other end according to the amount of stress that's placed on the structure. The idea being that you didn't want to have too much metal, you didn't want to have too little metal, obviously. It's sort of the Goldilocks principle. Mm, You want to have just the right amount of material. And it's really a hallmark of American engineering to, to be that careful with the proportion of the material. So that's what we mean when we say it's a a proportioned structure. David, you've highlighted the American aspects of this bridge, which I love, but who built it? Right. It was built by the Maslin Bridge Company in 1882. And it's interesting, the Maslin Bridge Company had been established um, as one of Ohio's multiple number of iron bridge builders. Ohio was blessed with a large number of iron uh, companies. And obviously, these kinds of bridge companies were established to take advantage of that fact. The Maslin Bridge Company was established in the 1860s, but was sold, uh, and a man named Andrew Sprague became the president of the company. Uh, He had been a salesman for the Smith Bridge Company, uh, the Smith Bridge Company that was so famous in um, wooden bridges, actually also got involved in iron bridges. And he bought the Maslin Company Uh, but maintained his home in in Toledo. And it was really uh, his efforts that um, began making uh, Maslin so widespread all across the state. And like many of these companies, they had very distinctive characteristics uh, in terms of their iron bridges. And the Maslin Bridge Company in particular had this um, lattice work uh, over the overhead bracing at the portal. And then they had distinctive ways of making the connections between the, the top bracing and the, in the uh, overhead bracing in the, in the structure, too. So you can look at this bridge, I mean, if, even if there wasn't a plaque on it, a nameplate on it, and say, that looks like a Maslin bridge. Ah. Scott, David had mentioned earlier that this bridge is open for traffic. Now, what kind of challenges does that present for, for you and your people? Well, it, it is still open to traffic. Um, It has deteriorated over the years, and that was part of the reason we put together a rehabilitation plan. However, the community wanted a new wide two-lane bridge, so we are trying to maintain traffic while it continues to deteriorate, and that has led us to restrictions that basically are for cars and trucks, pickup trucks only. Uh, We can't take school buses. We can't take farm equipment. We can't... um, take any large vehicles across the structure a weight limit involved with that yeah i actually i think we have it down at three tons now okay okay scott around the time that this bridge was built it was evident that things like wagons and horses were going to come over it is that still something that happens today 
Yeah, actually it is. We have an Amish community that lives in the area, and we have a lot of horse-drawn vehicles that are still utilizing that bridge today. I have a variety of traffic. It is a one-lane bridge. It's only 16 feet wide, so it has certain challenges. Uh, the location of the bridge makes it challenging for traffic to uh, navigate through without um, interfering with oncoming traffic. And then you throw in, you know, different speeds of vehicles, modern cars, and horse-drawn um, traffic. So um, it is challenging, and it, it presents a lot of challenges to the area. But you've been able to, so far, preserve the integrity of, of the original structure. Yeah, we have. We've really, over the years, we've had many rehabilitations to it where we've replaced some of the flooring system with modern steel and um, steel stringers and, and new floor decking, timber decking. Um, and it still has timber decking on it today. Uh, and then we, we have an asphalt coating. But, um, you know, steel rust. A lot worse than than what you see with iron so the the steel deteriorates a lot faster and and it's a challenging it's very challenging to keep up with the the maintenance on it scott what's the future then of this bridge looking like well we have put together some alternative plans that we presented to the public uh, one of those was to rehab the original bridge as it was and maintain it um, the second one was to rehab the structure and add a 35 mile an hour curve to the end of the bridge so that it was easier to navigate and, and for vehicles to get through it. And then the final alternative was to bypass the structure with a new wide two lane road bridge with a 55 mile an hour curve that could take modern traffic at modern speeds as well as still accommodating the local Amish community and horse-drawn vehicles. So um, we are proceeding with a replacement with a two-lane structure. So we have uh, federal funding for that project, similar to what we've done with some other bridges, but uh, it will be 80% federal funding, and it is scheduled for construction in 2020. David, how does the Ohio Historic Bridge Association view the Logansville Iron Bridge? Well, the Ohio Historic Bridge Association was founded in 1960 to save a particular uh, covered bridge in Muskingum County. But since the, that time, we've come to realize that, that iron bridges like this, um, stone bridges, concrete bridges, really have a lot to tell us about our uh, engineering heritage in the state. And we conduct tours and uh, lectures around the state on a regular basis to try and promote the preservation. We have worked with other iron bridges like this, uh, one at Orient, Ohio, where we actually cleared trees away from it that were growing into the bridge um, and uh, see that there may be an opportunity to do similar things and, and work with Logan County in the future to, to physically preserve this bridge, too. Thank you for watching another edition of History in Your Own Backyard. I'm Susie Selleck, and today we're in Bell Fountain, Ohio. David Simmons, president of the Ohio Historic Bridge Association, thank you for joining us. Glad to have been here. And Scott Coleman, the Logan County engineer, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And remember, travel, travel slowly, slowly and stop, stop often. often. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.